Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Walt and we now turn to Song of Myself passage number 5. We are of course in these talks with Walt working through each one of the poems of the deathbed edition of Whitman's Leaves of Grass. A colleague actually at the very beginning of my planning of this set of talks said, what are you going to do about Song of Myself 5? One of the very early questions that I was asked because, well, this is one of the most famous, dare we say it, infamous passages of all of Leaves of Grass. What in heaven's name is going on? We'll jump into it, no pun intended, in a moment. First, however, some assumptions quickly. My assumption is that you've been working with us at LearnStrong.net. Find down that left-hand side where it says Talks with Walt and that you were with us for the 24 uh, poems of inscriptions as well as the 19 sections from starting from Pomenoc and in, in regards to Song of Myself, the introductory set of comments, and then of course the previous four sections have already been discussed. Now I said to you guys, when we started inscriptions and starting from Pomenoc, that we were doing that reading to get ready to read, and I really believe this, I think you have to have that background to be able to read Song of Myself so that when we come to passage number five, we're not too immediately shocked by what we find, although let's say it out loud, this is what led so many people in the early years after, really from uh, 1855 to 1865, those 10 years, any time that you brought up Leaves of Grass, there was usually going to be something that was said about the passage we will now enjoy. And I think we should enjoy it often referred to as that ecstatic embrace of body and soul. But here's what I want to say. Hey guys, lots and lots of ink has been spilled on the lines we're about to read. I just want you to read them on your own and with me, and you figure out what you think's going on here, because obviously these lines can be interpreted a whole lot of ways. I believe in you, my soul. The other I am must not abase itself to you, and you must not be abased to the other. Loaf with me on the grass, loose the stop from your throat. Not words, not music or rhyme I want, not custom or lecture, not even the best, only the lull I like, the hum of your vowed voice. I mind how once we lay such a transparent summer morning, how you settled your head athwart my hips and gently turned over upon me and parted the shirt from my bosom bone and plunged your tongue to my bare stripped heart and reached till you felt my beard and reached till you held my feet, swiftly arose and spread around me the peace and knowledge that pass all the argument of the earth. And I know that the hand of God is the promise of my own. And I know that the Spirit of God is the brother of my own. And that all the men ever born are also my brothers and the women my sisters and lovers. And that a calcium of the creation is love. And limitless are leaves, stiff or drooping in the fields. And brown ants in the little wells beneath them. And mossy scabs of the worm fence, heaped stones, elder, mullein, and poke weed. Now, it's true that there have been some readers, and certainly this happened in the time of, of Whitman himself, who got this far into Leaves of Grass and then just decided, that's it, I've had enough, this is over the top. But I think we have to be aware that Whitman was drawing on ancient traditions when he wrote a set of lines like this. First of all, the Christian mystics are going to play around sometimes with, uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, erotica as, as they come to try to describe certain kinds of translinguistic spiritual union uh, and they're going to use language which sounds incredibly sexualized but they're not going to be talking about any kind of physical or even, we might say, pornographic style of sexualities, even though, of course, this has been labeled as such, no question, pornographic and obscene was, in fact, one of the labels that was applied to this. There were certain writers of his own time, like Melville, who just couldn't go here. It was like, this is just too much. Emerson himself, 
went to comment on Leaves of Grass several times to Whitman saying, I think you better pull it back. I don't think that your audience is ready for this. Whitman, however, as we've said, growing up in that radical Quaker background of Elias Hicks and others, was familiar with a passage, for example, like the one I'll share with you now from the Song of Solomon, or sometimes referred to as the Song of Songs, chapter 8. Now, this is the King James Version of this reading. I've had students that when they encounter this set of lines, they're stunned by it. They're like, wait, that's in the Bible? Are you serious with me? Of course, Song of Solomon has been difficult to exegete for any number of biblical scholars over the years. Let's just enjoy the, the lines from Song of Solomon 8, 1 through 5. Oh, that thou wert as my brother that sucked the breasts of my mother. When I should find thee without, I would kiss thee, yea, I should not be despised. I would lead thee and bring thee into my mother's house, who would instruct me. I would cause thee to drink of spiced wine and the juice of my pomegranate. His left hand should be under my head, and his right hand should embrace me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that ye stir not, nor awake my love until he please. Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I raise thee up from the apple tree where thy mother brought thee forth. There she brought thee forth that bear thee. Now, lines such as these, and a good number of others that we could find, of course, in the King James 1611, were, I believe, lines that Whitman read and knew well. So that as he played the game here, and that, I mean, I think that we have to see these poems in unison. You'll remember in passage four, he called it the game. I think he is playing games with us, and I think he's playing a very serious game, but also a very fun game for him. I cannot help but believe that all his life, when Whitman had to defend lines like this, there was a little bit of the cheeky smile somewhere for Whitman inside of himself that said, I can't believe you people don't get this, that I'm playing games here. Now, first of all, clearly, Whitman is messing around with the mind-body or the soul-body dualism that we've spoken of so many times before in our discussions and our lectures on Plato, for example. Of course, go back to those lectures that we gave already on Eidolons, that poem from the early section here in Inscriptions. I told you when we did Eidolons, and again, if you haven't been with me for that lecture, I recommend that you go back to that one, but you'll remember when we started with Eidolons, I said go back to an earlier lecture that I gave on Plato's Republic, especially Book 6 and 7, The Theory of the Forms and the idea of Plato's dualism, that in fact in the first box, to use the language of my lecture, we have a beautiful body, but in the second box we have the concept of beauty itself. How in the first box things go away, but that stuff of the second box doesn't quite so easily go away. The first box physical, the second box metaphysical, and it begs the question, where are you going to put Ruthie's tree? Well, obviously you're going to put the physical tree of Ruthie's tree in the first box because it's other related to the five senses. But in the second box, you're going to put, of course, the word nature with maybe a capital N there or the word energy, of course. Well, where are you going to put you? That is to say, Whitman, this is his question. Where are you going to put me? Well, in the first box, obviously you're going to put a body there. But what are you going to put in the second box? There's the difficulty of language. This is why we call it translinguistic. Some will call it soul. Some will call it mind. Some will call it consciousness. It really doesn't matter what you call it. Whitman is quite fascinated in the tension between those two. And now he's going to speak directly to it. Notice... He begins with an affirmation that's epistemological in nature, what you can know. I believe in you, my soul. The other I am, that is to say the body, must not abase itself to you. Now we're going to come back to this, so put it in your notes at 3a, when we meet in Song of Myself, passage 48. I have said that the soul is not more than the body, and I've said that the body is not more than the soul, and nothing not God is greater to one than oneself is maybe some of the most radical lines of Song of Myself, but they're built off of these opening lines of five of Song of Myself. He says, and you must not be abased to the other. In other words, Whitman, living in a time when there was this tension between the body and the soul, between what is considered to be low, Plato certainly thought of the body as disgusting and low, all the terrible smells and all the grossness of the human body. And then there's this thing, spirit. And of course, Plotinus, the, the, the Neoplatonist, will follow in the same tradition. 
Whitman is having none of it. He wants to celebrate both body and soul together, and that together, that union is what now will be related in the most ecstatic, some will call it just patently sexual language. He begins with the word loaf. Now again, this is a key word because it's going to carry with it both positive and very pejorative connotations. To be a loaf is of course to lay around, to maybe be understood as lazy. But in Whitman's day, the word probably meant as well contented as in at ease, a word that we're familiar with from Leaves of Grass. Loaf with me on the grass now, obviously we're beginning to join. At, at passage five into passage six, we're going to come to terms with why he will call his poems Leaves of Grass. Loose the stop from your throat. Now, this is a powerful line, and it's going to carry a lot of interesting implications. In other words, say what you want to say, or sing what you want to sing. Notice, he then will list several nots. Not words, not music or rhyme I want, not custom or lecture. There's a bit of irony for that, given what we're doing now. Not even the best. In other words, when I'm loafing, he will say, his body speaking to his soul. This may be the Whitman I myself, the real Whitman. We're obviously going to wonder which one of the real Whitmans we're speaking with. When finally he says, I'm ready to come to terms with who I am ontologically, I don't even want, I don't even want any of those other things. I don't even want your best. Only this is what I want. The lull I like. No, it's, a, it's an amazing word, lull. Uh, Mozart will, of course, have said that the music is not in the notes, but the space within the notes. He could have easily uh, said the lull between the notes, and certainly Whitman is playing around with that as well. Now, the great critiquer who we mentioned before is so influential in our thinking, and obviously revered in 303 Harold Bloom, argues that these lines coming are the heart of Leaves of Grass early on, and you have to be able to read these lines well and understand them. He will talk about them in their autoerotic kind of connotations. And he will make the argument that, in fact, there is no other person here with Whitman that it is all a metaphysical construct. I'm going to leave it to you to decide. Notice he says, I low, I low it like the low, the hum of, the, of your valved voice. And again, this is the beautiful thing of the singing and the, and the music of, of uh, Leaves of Grass. And, and I mean, just listen to that line. Only the low I like the hum of your valved voice. Do you hear all those L sounds that make this such a beautiful, and the repetition of the V sounds make this so beautiful. Now, we begin with, ironically, I mind. No question, the use of the word mind here. I, guys, everything for Whitman is intentional. How do I know that? Well, he edited and re-edited, and we're going to talk about several ways in which he edited these lines from the 1855 edition. No, no, he studied these lines closely. So when he uses the word mind, he knows the Cartesian of the Descartes-related, uh, I think, therefore, I am, cogigo de ator sum, that, that notion that I'm, I'm aware that there's this thing called my mind that's working. Wait a minute, what is the I that's aware of that, this mind-body dualism of Descartes? So we're going to play around with the word mind right from the start. I mind, which means I remember or I think about how. Notice it's once. In other words, this is a memory. This is a reverie of a kind. When, in fact, mind and body finally found their way together, and that was, of course, the recognition of soul. How once we lay, by the way, in the 1855, it was in June, edited out, such a transparent summer morning. The word transparent is important because it's going to take us to Emerson and that famous eyeball. We've given our lectures on Emerson's essays and of course nature comes to mind here. Emerson knew what Whitman was doing. He understood the game, can we use that language, that Whitman was playing. He just wasn't sure that it was appropriate, you know what I mean? He just wasn't sure that it was correct or right. Lay such a transparent summer morning. How you settled your head athwart my hips. Now, obviously, the moment that you read this in 1855, you cannot believe what it is that you're reading, even though, of course, Whitman will defend himself by saying, well, look at Song of Solomon, path, chapter 8, and what is being said there, or any number of other passages in Song of Solomon. It's pretty clear. And, of course, notice the language here of the word athwart. 
uh, uh, that is to say, over the hips, right? So obviously we're back to the earlier use of crotch when we were wor when we were working earlier in Song of Myself, right? Athwart my hips, the word gently, of course, is going to be beautiful, turned over up on me. Now, that, of course, in and of itself is clearly a very erotic kind of set of lines, but then to continue, it's as if he's doubling down and parted the shirt. The use of the word parted is compelling. We said that the front piece image of the 1855 edition of Lisa Grass showed Whitman with his shirt unbuttoned. It was already setting us up for lines such as this. And many will argue in 1855, this is disgusting language. We, of course, read it today, and we're kind of surprised that people got so fired up about this. But certainly it was a different time. But be that as it may, let's go ahead and appreciate what it is that he says happens next. And parted the shirt from my bosom bone, that is to say the chest, and plunged your tongue to my bare stripped Heart. Now, it's interesting that he would use the word heart here. He, didn't, he doesn't use the word soul. He doesn't use the word mind. But rather, he uses the very word heart itself. In other words, I remember how you broke open my chest and went to my heart. Now, go back to some earlier comments that we've made on Pushkin's classic, The, the Prophet, and the way in which... The, 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 literally, the chest is torn open. I think you've got to go back and look at this. It's quite a remarkable thing that the greatest Russian poet and the greatest American poet, who are quasi-contemporaries of each other, whether they actually knew each other or not is a debate and probably didn't, and yet they both are writing this really amazing kind of language about what it's like when an idea takes its place in your inner psyche in your heart, to use the language here. I mean, a 3B question. I mean, when's the last time that you were enjoined with an idea, it might be now, actually, for some of you, that you were just like, almost like lit on fire. It just like, you quivered with the, this kind of recognition that, wow, what's going on here is quite remarkable. Here he says, I remember how this happened. And just, I mean, again, it's a, it's a third doubling down, right? Because, I mean, you're reading this in 1855 going, whoa, 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 what is going on here? And then, and reached till you felt my beard, and reached till you held my feet. What in heaven's name is going on? Now, of course, many readers have pointed out, this can't be literal. It obviously has to be metaphoric, or because we're talking, of course, about um, all kinds of interesting physicality happening here. How in heaven's name can that even happen? Are we speaking literally? Are we speaking metaphorically? And notice the word held. We've been seeing this word. I told you when we were messing around and starting from Pomenoc. I mean, you'll remember I said every time the word held or hold comes up, you might want to pay attention to it because we knew we were coming to this holding of the feet reaching up to touch the beard. In other words, taking, taking all of the body into uh, inclusion. Now that's all that there is of the specific moment of the erotica. And then there's the afterwards moment, whatever it is that we're reading, swiftly arose and spread around me the peace, he, can, he, he says, and joy, he, he adds and joy in the 1855, and knowledge that pass all the argument of the earth. And now we're back to his trippers and askers of passage four, those talkers of passage three, the skeptics who don't want to include him on the shelves and the inscriptions. In other words, we're to Milton's Paradise Lost Book One and the argument to justify the ways of God to men. Whitman definitely knows the game he's playing here, to use his language, the game he's playing here, as he now will point out that there's this beautiful argument that is the outcome, if you will, of all of this erotic language, of all of this experience. Well, what is that? It's a recognition. To, you know, of course, Wordsworth will call it intention, right? Dim and faint, right? But it, it's a recognition. And, notice the repetition of the word and, 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 this anaphoria that we're going to see at, three, at 2b. And I know... Now we're to epistemology. Notice we started with I believe. Now we're to I know. 
I know that the hand of God, of course this is a directly biblical reference, the hand of God, notice the irony of the hands earlier are the hands in that erotic section, and now it's the hand of God, is the promise of my own. By the way, um, in the 1855, he used the term elder hand, elder hand, right? The hand is the promise of my own. In other words, there is something for Whitman that's quasi-religious about the experience that he's having, and I know that the Spirit of God, notice we go from the hand of God to the Spirit of God, is the brother of my own. In the 1855, it was the eldest brother of my own. The inclusivity, again, of his philosophic position. He continues, and that all the men ever born are also my brothers. I mean, again, if his three uh, key elements of his poem, he said it, right, in passage 10, of starting from Pominock, was, you'll remember, love, democracy, and the greatness of religion. We're playing with all three of these in this quite remarkable passage. And I know that the Spirit of God is the brother of my own, and that all the men ever born are also my brothers, and the women, my sisters, okay, fine, no, and lovers, which all of a sudden takes us right back to the erotic passage of before. Now, some, of course, have wanted to see this as somehow a homosexual passage for Whitman. Notice that he doesn't allow for that in the poem itself. What in heaven's name are we saying when he says, all the women ever born are my lovers? It's a very interesting line. It's a very compelling line. He continues. This is what else I know. And that a Kelson of the creation is love. Now, this is amazing. Because you probably don't know that Kelson has something to do with ships. And if you go and Google this and learn what this is about, we're talking about the very backbone of the ship itself is the Kelson. In other words, what is he saying is the backbone of creation? It's love. So here we are dealing now with the key elements of Leaves of